So we're here with uh, Professor Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winner in economics. And on a personal note, I must say I had him as a, as a teacher when I was a graduate student uh, at, uh, at MIT. So, uh, and I'm a big fan. And just about, I think, everyone in development economics and in economics and in philosophy is a fan of your, of, of, of your work. You exaggerate, but thank you. <laughs> the, the first question I wanted to ask you is a very general question, which I think under, uh, I think, interests both teachers and students. And we're at the graduate student and we're a graduate institute and we're a collection of teachers and students. What do you see as being the relationship between research and teaching? It's a very interesting question. I think one could answer that at two different levels. At a personal level for me, all my research have been quite closely connected with, with teaching. Uh, because uh, A, because the questions that come up while I'm teaching are things that I often take up in pursuing research. And also when I arrive at some kind of understanding, whether it may be a mathematical result, a theory, and say in social choice theory, uh, or some other technical field, or whether it's a more of a verbal understanding of something. Uh, I am very anxious to share this with young, bright minds who could uh, comment, criticize, and who don't have the, the restraint uh, that often people have at later in life in being not uh, uh, be wanting to be confrontational. Well, some do, but, but students are marvelous that way. So for my uh, research, they're very thoroughly dependent on teaching. And to, to a great extent, I hope I'm able to reflect in my teaching what my uh, uh, research findings tend to be. So for me, they're very closely linked. Now, for many others, this is not. And I think, uh, that's why I said you can answer it two different levels. Because aside from being an academic myself, I've, of course, had the uh, opportunity of being um, uh, involved in educational uh, arrangements. And for example, I was the head of a Cambridge college, Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, Isaac Newton's college, Francis Bacon's college, and so on. And um, so when I was there, there was also a question of uh, how the work uh, of particular fellows are going. Now, there, sometimes you encounter a person who is excellent at teaching. On the other hand, is not doing any research. Now, the way the American uh, exercises have traditionally gone, um, to assess them. If they're not doing research, they tend to be immediately shot out. Uh, the, uh, the English, and you know, Cambridge is in England, uh, I'm talking about that Cambridge Trinity. So uh, they increasingly have moved to something called a research assessment exercise. Now, first of all, I think that far too mechanical. How many papers did you publish? How many referees did you Just doesn't capture the assessment that a human critical mind can make. But of course, aside from the crudity of the criteria, there is also the problem that there could be an excellent teacher who is not going to be a great researcher. And to say that therefore you can't teach seems absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> because that, that's a real waste of uh, resource and talent. But you were talking about the quantitative criteria. You've had a remarkable, you've displayed a remarkable capacity during your career in terms of your scientific output of communicating ideas extremely elegantly, both verbally and mathematically. Uh, this seems to be becoming exceedingly rare in our profession, the capacity to both write beautifully in the language of Shakespeare and to prove rigorous theorems. What is your secret for doing this? <laughs> I don't think I, you're, you're very kind to say that. But, you know, partly, I mean, of course, mathematics have been one of my interests for a long time. When I was in school, my two favorite science subjects were mathematics and classics, which in India means Sanskrit. And these were the two competitions. But Sanskrit, of course, is very concerned with how do you put it, how do you place it. Um, Sanskrit is quite a rich language. Of almost any concept you could have 
about 15, 20, 25 concepts. And when I ultimately, when I wrote a book on justice after many years of effort, called The Idea of Justice, which came out in 2009, I, uh, the whole discussion turned on the distinction between two different um, words for justice, and there were 20 altogether, but two of them very often used, Naya and Niti, that distinction, they're not, they both stand for justice, but they're not exactly the same. And that distinction proved to be very central to the philosophical analysis I was trying to present. So for that kind of work, of course, uh, being concerned with the nature of the language is important, something which um, 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 Wittgenstein uh, clearly understood and, uh, and talked about, and so did many others. Uh, philosophers who are not often remembered li now, uh, like Anthony Gramsci, uh, he has a whole series of uh, uh, um, contributions about how language involves um, uh, philosophy. And so I think that has been quite important for me. But since I was also interested in mathematics, I wasn't particularly interested in the kind of maths that I mostly had to do when I was a student of economics and maths in Calcutta. Uh, because that was mostly um, uh, mathematics or physics, uh, you know, differential equations and so on. Uh, but uh, I think most of those uh, structures were difficult to apply in economics because of our nature of the variables. They're discrete rather than continuous. And also many of them have ambiguity. So kind of uh, odd concepts like um, uh, incomplete ordering, fuzzy sets, capturing ambiguity precisely, is much more interesting. As it happened, there's an enormous amount of mathematics uh, on that, connected with mathematical logic. But very uh, few applications. Yes, and actually in my work on social choice theory, and if somebody said, what is your main area, I think probably it would be social choice theory. And that, of course, the, my main stay there had been that kind of analysis, which I really enjoy doing. But you see, I think um, once, you have, once you have completed the mathematical proof, uh, just uh, for example, Ken, uh, Kenneth Arrow had a, a theorem called impossibility theorem. theorem. So I, I, I tried to show certain ways of avoiding that problem, but also show that certain ways of generalizing it with, without some of the assumptions that Arrow made. It, it's a profound theorem, uh, his, <laughs> not mine, but I tried to extend it, and I think I did succeed in extending it. Kenneth Arrow for a long time resisted that, but eventually he did accept that. I, I think all that is based on his insights. Nothing would have happened without Arrow's insight. But, um, but once I've got the result, uh, and it's not a complicated, and actually two weeks ago I was in a class, I was teaching my students uh, how the proof works. Uh, you have to not only uh, check rigorously how each step is proceeding, but what is the whole thing about? How, what sense can you make of it? And you know, in some ways, I think I have, a, I have a very primitive mind. So once I have proved something, I have to ask, so how would I put it in a nutshell? What is going on? Why should we expect that? But you don't burn time? your notes like Marshall to be able then to write it up in beautiful prose. You keep your mathematical notes, unlike Marshall. Yes, uh, Marshall was a very different kind of an economist. Well, for one thing, he was a proper mathematician, as one said. But no, I don't. And you know, when I wrote my uh, book, Collective Choice and Social Welfare, uh, uh, in 1970, it came out, uh, the chapters showed my schizophrenia, the, the alternative. One, one star. One is in prose, one star, I like to think of it being in poetry, but it's really in mathematical notation and mathematical reasoning, uh, uh, and no compromise on symbolism and operations there. So one, one star, two, two star, similarly say seven, seven star, seven is in English without any maths at all. That's Marcellian, if you like. And then seven star is, is, uh, is well, well, Quite a lot of problem with, um, even actually, uh, Marshall is such a great economist, but sometimes people have raised questions. One of the questions was raised by Pierre Zappa quite early in the 1920s. 
Namely, why does he say that? Now, there must have been some math behind it, but if you don't publish that, he did actually. He had several books called it, one of them. He did, uh, did have uh, uh, the mathematics there. But you have to have it some stage because some guy is going to ask saying, look, I don't believe it, I challenge it. Then you have to say, okay, now this is how it goes. But what do you think of the, the, the f well, first of all, in a more general sense, the formalization in our field, but if I take the specific example of development economics today, when sometimes, and some of our colleagues have the impression that we're turning in development economics, as, as in physics, one goes through sort of an experimental phase and a theoretical phase, and we're probably in the middle of an experimental phase yeah. in development economics. One sometimes gets the impression these days that we're moving towards becoming glorified epidemiologists and simply asking whether things work or not rather than why they work or not. And I'm being provocative here, Amartya. What, what, no, what, I, what is, what yeah, I, I, I accept that you're being provocative. Uh, uh, I think it's a, a, it's a good provocation. Uh, um, I, I, I can't claim to have talked deeply about this question, um, uh, but uh, I think diagnosis about what would work, what would not, is quite important because the world has been full of uh, well-intended uh, organizations. If you think about it, the, uh, you see, the, if you look at, for example, the Soviet uh, economic system, I mean, there was one a political problem namely doing it without a democratic structure as a real problem. The main point of yeah, course. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's why. And there, I must say, ideas like the dictatorship or the proletariat, etc., et really didn't translate to anything tangible in a political point. That was the main failure. But there was also a failure that there was a great deal of uh, grand imagination uh, not just only in, in Marx, but even in Lenin. But uh, the translation of that required a much uh, more uh, institutional thinking that they uh, didn't have. It's very odd because in some ways the discipline of uh, Marxism could be taught to have put institution very much at the center. Uh, and yet, I think there was a failure when it comes to look at the future. I don't think it's a failure of Marx, because as far as Marx is concerned, he was identifying difficulties. He didn't think that there's going to be a, a, a revolution around him. And when the October Revolution happened, and there was a very um, um, uh, electric moment for many people in the world, uh, uh, just. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, uh, three days ago, mm -hmm. Eric Hobsbawm, the great Marxist historian, died. And I was looking at one of his um, uh, books, Interesting Times, when he said, well, no matter how badly the Soviet Union might have worked out, there is no question that the October Revolution was a great moment of time for the, for the human sense of dignity about all human beings, etc. Didn't translate that way. Let, let me ask you a, a question which is simple, but therefore probably impossible to answer. Why are some people poor and some people rich? And what can we do about it? What would be Amartya Sen's... Uh, <laughs> what's your, what's, uh, you're, you're, you're too smart to, to, to give silver bullets. We'll let that be done by social commentators who... Yeah, I'm, who, I'm not, uh, who, who, I who, don't who, sell silver No, exactly. So why, why, are there, why are some people poor and some people rich? Well, I, I think in some ways that is a question I did have to address when I did my book on famines. Because uh, it is concerned with the issue that uh, in order to be, uh, in the case of famines, I was concerned, do, does this person, does this family have the means to buy food? Now, in order to, if you don't have the means to buy food, no matter how much food there is in the country, you, you're bound to starve, uh, unless there is a government coming in and helping you out. Now, given that, uh, the, you have to ask, how does a person uh, become entitled to food in terms of market entitlement to be able to go and say, here's my money, give me some food. Now, um, then it turns on what how do we get the 
income. Uh, for most of us, uh, we have only one resource uh, for the bulk of humanity. Now it's through, namely, labor. Sometimes skilled labor, if we have luck and we have had education. Sometimes not very skilled labor, sometimes completely unskilled labor. So it's a question of how you sell it. Now, if you are in a situation where you cannot get employment at all, and you live in a country which has no unemployment insurance, no social security, no safety net, well, then you will starve because there's no way you can buy food. So I think the, ultimately it must be connected with what have you got to sell in the market and whether there's a demand for it and what kind of price it's going. Now, I think, and that's why wages are so important because it's through the wages that people earn uh, their ability to buy anything else except to the extent that the state provides it, like public health care, public education, and sometimes even public distribution of food, sometimes free food, sometimes cheap food. So all these have to be taken into account. But as far as the individual capacity, your question is concerned, namely what people make for your own wage, it really depends to a great extent on what we can sell, and in particular, how uh, uh, how is our labor uh, uh, available, uh, labor power? Marx made a big distinction between labor and labor power. How does the labor power uh, available for marketing and at what price? And so the, um, I think it, the whole question really turns on that. And if there are other things that you can think of, educated people command higher wage, yes. Uh, because uh, their labor productivity is higher and also their status is higher. It's not all productivity, there are many other issues. Um, similarly, nutrition, often there was a big discussion uh, about how undernourishment makes you uh, less prone to find employment and, 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 and that would make you keep poor. But then, of course, once you are very poor, then you are a trap because you get the, can't get the food. So, so do, do you believe in the existence of poverty traps? Some of our colleagues... Yeah, I, I don't, you know, it's, um, uh, I, I think the, um, uh, David Ray, it was his Stanford PhD. And if we go back to Rosenstein, Rodin and people, people... people. That's right, he was, others are also doing that, yeah. Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thought and certainly the contribution of nourishment to, um, uh, to productivity and to earning an income and making a positive contribution to the economy as well as becoming a bit richer or less poor. Uh, certainly, it's, it's worth pointing out. But there are many other elemental relationships, I think. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think it was um, uh, quite an um, um, important issue to emphasize. But um, I don't see the trap makes it, uh, you know. There are many others you could say, if you don't have education, you get very low level. But in terms of non-convexity, some sort of non-convexity leading? Well, I know I'm sure your well, listeners are going to follow your non-convexity thing, so let me translate it into common language. That is, if, if, you, if you're not educated, you get a low wage. And if education is not available free, then you may not get yourself more educated. That's another trap. There are many such traps. Trap really means, in this case, that it works both ways. A, low A tends to lead to low B, low B tends to lead to low A, and that's a vicious, a vicious circle. Opposite of it may be a virtuous circle. High A leads to high B, high B leads to high A. I think it's very important to look at all these things, because these, uh, the economics is a subject where our interrelationships are very important. Uh, the kind of single-minded single concentration on any one relation over all others it, it is not a particularly good thing. But when you're taking a broad view, yes, all those things that may appear like a trap, which are basically a simultaneity of relationships, um, they have, we'll have to Marcia, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you a question for the benefit of young economists. What would be, if you, ha if you had the, the chance and you have the chance, 
to, to tell young economists, to give them a piece of advice, someone who's, someone who's just finishing a PhD in economics or who's finishing a master's in economics, what, what advice would you give to them in terms of what they should do with the knowledge that they've learned? Well, that's a complicated question. It's a horrible question. <laughs> it's a horrible question. But horrible questions deserve an answer. Uh, so let me say three things on that. First of all, um, I think our ability to do uh, interesting work uh, depends to a great extent on what moves us, what makes us curious, what are the questions that we would like to solve. So given that, it would be always a mistake to say, look, this is a very important problem. I'm bored by it, but I'll still do it. I think it has to be something that excites you. Secondly, among the things that excite you, there could be many such things, what are the really uh, important problems in your assessment uh, for the world? Or, I mean, that sounds pompous, but it, it's not really. We are always doing it, even if it, uh, we cannot say that without blushing. But uh, of these things that interest me, A, B, C, and D, I won't go for E and F because it doesn't interest me and I'm not excited by it at all. But A, B, C, D, E, which, if I had achieved something there, would be something I should be proud of because I've done something for the society. So that's the second thing to look at among the <coughs> category of things that you might work on. And the third one is perhaps to avoid your question, namely not get other people's advice about what you ought to do. <laughs> and, 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 uh, I've got some very good advice. I've also got some very rotten advice. You have to be in the driving seat and decide which advice to take and which advice uh, not to take. There's a lovely passage when Buddha, Gautam Buddha, is having a conversation with one of his disciples and somebody refers to a very complicated argument and he said, how would I view that? And Buddha says, well, respect that argument but don't trust it. <laughs> and I think, don't trust advices, but of course respect them. <laughs> Amartya Sen, thank you very, very much. Uh, I've had the privilege now of spending a few minutes. I should have been sitting at your feet, actually listening that, to that you. And we should have been under a banyan tree. Uh, would, have been, would have been a lot more pleasant. But thank you very, very much for your time and for answering these very often simplistic questions. Thank you.